thank you very much and I'm delighted to be here and have the opportunity to sit and chat to you and listen to you hopefully as much as you're going to listen uh, to me uh, as well. Um, I thought I'd start off by showing you a very short video of the World Special Olympic Games which were held here in Ireland in 2003 because um, hearing that it was young people that were going to be here I was thinking well that's six years ago some of them could be just you know in college or even younger at that stage and it all could have passed them by and they mightn't have known even what happened so I thought I would just show you that it's about six minutes long but it gives you an idea I suppose not just about Special Olympics but also the scale of the event that happened because what I'm going to talk about then will be based mainly around sort of leadership and how we organise the Games, what really made them the phenomenal success um, that they were. Um, so, and then following on from, from that, if, if all those videos work, <laughs> you never know with technology, do you? Um, it's wonderful when it works. Um, following on then, when I'm finished, I'm going to show a very short um, clip uh, that hopefully will um, inspire you. It's words more than anything else set to music that will try and synopsize, I suppose, um, or capture what, what I've said uh, earlier on. So that's the plan, and then I'd obviously like to uh, chat to you and to hear um, your views um, about leadership and about even what we can do now in these tough, tough and interesting times. Uh, people say it's a pause, but having looked at the SRI yesterday, <laughs> I'm beginning to think it's more than a pause we're having. It's a full stop nearly for the moment. <laughs> long pause. <laughs> well, it's a long pause by the looks of things. Five years, wow. <laughs> Um, but anyway, we'll, uh, we have to be brave and get on with things and just do the best we can under the circumstances. And the thing about it is it's tough for everybody. It's tough globally, so we're not alone in the, in the situation. And um, I think we can be positive and we can find ways to get over it. More importantly, I think we have to find ways to keep people in jobs that have jobs uh, uh, and to ensure that there are jobs created for young people coming out of college as well. And I think if the government, and collectively, not just the government, but all of us collectively, if we can do anything uh, to help that, I think that is the most important thing. I think people taking cuts and the taxes that we're all getting and the pensions and the levies and everything, you know, they are necessary and I think they're fine. And at the end of the day, people still have jobs um, and the most critical thing, I think, is keeping that safeguarding the employment in Ireland. If we can do anything to ensure that that happens, then it's, it's, it's a really good thing. So, anyway, we'll watch the video and uh, then I'll chat to you for a while. So there you go. If you did pass you by, that's a little snapshot of what, what was involved. And I suppose... Um, it was an extraordinary thing to do at the time in Ireland because nothing like that had ever been done before and the games like that had always been held in the United States so it was the first time it was held outside the States and when the games were held in the States it was quite different than it being held in, in Ireland because um, usually the games were held between two universities or even sometimes one university that could accommodate five or ten thousand people um, and that could feed them and most of the facilities were there and everything whereas we were talking about um, 50 sporting venues um, 60 accommodation venues I mean it was just you know the whole Ireland the whole island of Ireland were involved uh, in the organizing of it so it was a much different it looked like a much different event uh, coming here to Ireland and um, we were bidding for the games for four years and we honestly at some at some points didn't think that we were going to, to get it because we thought you know Ireland where we're situated everything you know we didn't even have a 50 meter pool which was a requirement Environment at the time we were bidding so we thought oh gosh no, we'll give it a chance anyway we'll give it our best shot and see what happens and sure enough then we got the games and the few of us that were like really really involved in the whole bidding process and that you know so deeply wanted the games to come to Ireland and wanted to do it just when we got the games looked at each other and thought Jesus what are we going to do now how are we going to do this because <laughs> we really didn't have much of a clue what we were going to do but I suppose what we did have was a huge amount of courage to do it, first of all, and belief in ourselves 
that we could actually do it. That yes, it was going to be tough. No, we hadn't a clue how we were going to um, recruit and train and motivate 30,000 volunteers, where we were going to get them from, how we'd roster them, how we'd clothe them, how we'd feed them, how we'd do everything about them, not to mention, you know, where we'd put the 165 countries, how we'd deal with all the different 52 different languages, um, you know, 177 host towns around the country, where, how were we even going to go about that? So there were all huge projects within one project and you could see you got a glimpse of what the opening ceremony was like in Crow Park. I mean even where were we going to start in terms of putting that together and then you saw the closing ceremony at the at the end but both packed to capacity um, with, with people and the interest and the enthusiasm was just huge. But courage and belief and I think you know if you look at things like the economy or uh, anything it is it is about uh, you know Barack Obama it's a, it's about a courage and a belief in yourself that you can do something and I think that's very important for young people as well starting out in their careers to actually believe that you can achieve and if you just you know look round at you know, I'm sure there's lots of people that you probably know or have heard of that have, that have you know, that were just ordinary people, but that took on something and decided to do it. And I suppose I have two examples. I think one is Rosa Parks. I mean, Rosa Parks took a decision over 50 years ago that she was going to. She was a black woman. She was tired. She was fed up. She was going to sit in that bus. And she didn't care what the consequences. And the consequences could have been quite detrimental for her in that position. But she decided to hell with it. I'm fed up with it. I'm sick of this segregation. I'm not going to put up with it anymore. I'm going to decide this is what I'm going to do. And I'm not going to get off that boat, get up off my seat for this person and let them sit down. And of course the consequences of that decision that she took were ginormous in terms of uh, segregation. Uh, absolutely ginormous. And, and yet it was one person just taking a decision I, I brought this along because I saw it just on the, in the Sunday Times. I was browsing through the Times last weekend, and it's about uh, Reka, a 12-year-old, leads bridal revolt. And quite common for, for, young, for young girls to be married off at 10 and uh, 12 in India. But she, Reka had decided her life would be different. She decided she wanted a different life. So she fought she fought her parents, she fought everybody around her, and she eventually, with the encouragement of her older sister and her teacher, she got her way, and uh, she, they, they, they allowed her then, they, she persuaded her parents to let her finish school and remain unmarried until she was 18. And she has like created, she had, she's met the president as a result of it, and she has rallied people around and has talked to thousands of people already, and this only happened, when did I say, last September, and is encouraging them not to marry off children at 10 and 12. And I just thought, isn't she fantastic? You know, to, at that age, to have that courage and to have that belief in herself. And I really do think that you can do anything. You can do anything. They, I, you know, I've heard... A saying at one stage that freedom is an inside job and I really believe it because freedom it's within us it's freedom is within us to do what we want to think what we want to behave the way we want to to take our own decisions in the way we, we in the way we want to lead our lives and do things um, and I think we forget that sometimes and we get drawn in by external factors, by ESRI reports, by all the sort of things that are going on around us, instead of actually thinking, I'm my own person. I've got this skill, I've got that skill. I'm, I'm, I'm well able, I'm well capable of doing things. Just do it. Just go and do it. And don't be influenced all the time by um, external groups and agencies, because that will stop you. It'll, and and there, there's always obstacles out there. There's always things to stop you doing things. Um, and, and I'm a great believer there's three S's in success, that you must see something first of all, that you must start it, and then that you must stick with it as the final S. You must stick with it until you get through it. And that's in a way was, I suppose, that the way that we went on in organising the, the games. We, we saw it, first of all. We had a vision of what we wanted. 
And, and anybody that's anyway, in any way successful, I think, has a vision. They have a road map. You know where you want to get to and you're trying to... Now, I think we're maybe a bit lacking in that sort of road map at the moment in Ireland, but we really do need it in order to get where we want to be. Um, so we had a very simple vision for those games, and it was so simple so that everybody around us and everybody that was going to be involved could understand it, and it was a games that the athletes would be proud to participate and Ireland would be proud to host. And even the snip of a video, if you never went to an event, if you never saw what happened in June 2003, they were something that everybody was proud of. Every single family that got involved, that hosted a country, every person that volunteered, from the president to the theatre, right to anybody that was picking up the papers or driving the buses or whatever, everybody felt proud. So the country felt proud, but every single country, every, every one of the 165 nations that came in as well felt very proud to be there and proud of the achievements of their own athletes as well. So pride was very much what we set out with in 1999 after we got over our shock of actually having won the bid in the first place. We then thought, right, what's the vision here? Pride is the vision. Well, if we heard, and you saw even the President spoke about being proud uh, on the video, but if we heard the word pride once, we heard it a million times over those uh, 16 days or whatever that the athletes uh, were in here. So it's, it is about having a vision, but then it's about, it's about starting it and sticking with it. Because we all, oftentimes you have vision, things come into your mind, but there are all sorts of factors that you know you, you forget about it or you don't continue it or you think oh it's not possible I couldn't do that or we've never done it before or whatever you know and it's sort of it's a fleeting thing and it goes by and that's it and you go on to, to, to something else but I think where you can actually um, start it and, and, and stick with it then is a real sign um, of success. Uh, one of the, 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 the other things as well that I think is critically important and uh, for us in the games it was hugely important and I think hugely important in, uh, in what we do ourselves every day is communication. Um, and I've also heard that the, 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 the worst thing is about communication is to think that you have communicated and I think that's true because you know sometimes we, um, there, well there's all the, the sort of general ways to communicate and communication communication is not rocket science as we all know I mean you're either face to face talking to somebody or you're emailing somebody or you're phoning somebody or blogging somebody or you're doing those are the ways we all communicate nothing to replace face to face of course it is the best way to communicate with anybody and to get your message um, across but I think sometimes you know we think we shoot off the email and we've sort of covered our own asses and we think that's it, we've done it, you know, we've sent the... But we don't know the other end, the person that's received that. Do they understand? Do they know? Do they know you know, have you... How, what's, the, what's the communication that you've sent meant to them? And I think that's important. And I think we can never underestimate the power of communication. And we commun we oh, nearly over communicated at the end of the day in terms of 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 what we were trying to do, um, but it it worked because everybody knew, everybody got engaged. I mean, we had so many agencies and groups, and both here in Ireland and abroad that uh, that we had to communicate with. Um, it was very challenging and it was very difficult, and we had to try and find all the various ways that to. to to do that but we did but it really stood to us at the end of the day because people understood what we were trying to do and they gave us the help that we needed then to do it so we achieved our goal through that at the end of the day now again I th again going back to uh, politics and Obama I think he does it very well he found the ways to communicate to get at people he wanted to get at he, re he did it in, in the most outstanding way and he continues to do it. If you notice what he's doing now, his communication is the thing because often it's about perception as well, you know. So, I, and and you look at our own situation, and in a way, 
Ireland is trying to do all the things that need to be done, the things I've mentioned, um, you know, trying to sort out the banks, trying to sort out employment, trying to do this, trying to do that. But we're not really getting enough of somebody getting up and saying that this is what we're doing and we will get out of this. We te- why do we tend to concentrate on the negative side? You know, the, the, the reports, the SRI, all that sort of stuff, that all it does is deflate people. We all know what the situation is, but somebody, you know, be positive and tell us, if we all work together, if we all do what we're supposed to do, we'll get out of this, we'll get over and we'll get on. And okay, we may be tough for a while, but you'll see better days um, ahead. And I think that's much more inspiring for somebody to hear uh, than all this doom and gloom. And we're giving ourselves such a poor reputation abroad as well. And I actually think we're doing that ourselves. Uh, the media hasn't helped us, but in a way, we're not helping ourselves. And leadership is very, is, is very important. And leadership, leadership is not rocket science. I mean, when I finished the, the, the games and we had the usual party that you have... I got a lovely photograph of myself with Nelson Mandela because I went out to meet him at the airport and he was just an amazing man, just inspirational to meet and spend some time with him and be with. But the the caption at the end of the, the picture that I got from the staff said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, to learn more, to do more, to become more, then you're a leader. And... You know, if you analyse that, and I've often looked at it in my, in my office since then, because it's pride of place and joy, <laughs> and balance, of course. But if you look at it, it's the simplest thing, but yet it's so important. And what are the words that are crucial there? Actions, your actions. It's back to freedom as an inside thing. It's, it's how you do, it's how you behave around people. At the end of the day, we're all people. And we all have to work together, and that's what makes life. That makes life, and that's what makes society either a good society or a poor society. How we interact with each other. So our actions, our attitude, how we respond, how we react is critically important. And if your actions inspire, is the other word. So if you can inspire somebody to do something, it's going to be much more beneficial and much more positive than trying to do something else, trying to deflate people. So. It's about your actions, it's about what we do every day, it's about inspiring people. And if you can inspire people to do a little bit more, to be more, then I believe you're a leader. Now, anybody can do that. Anybody. In any position, in, 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 a, in an organisation, um, in a corporation, um, in an agency, wherever it is, we're all responsible, we're all leaders. My job in 2003 as the CEO of the organisation was to to try and um, spread that message about leadership and to try and have a sense of leadership that would sort of cascade right down throughout the organisation. Because there's no point me, I needed to be a leader, but there was no point me just leading because you can't do something like that by yourself. You can't organise something like that on your own. And it did take every one of those 30,000 people and the 300-odd staff that worked with me, and thousands and thousands of others, um, from government to corporate community to other agencies that got involved. It took um, all that. But we all had to be leaders in terms of what we did. And sometimes that's not recognised either. And sometimes employers and persons uh, in places of responsibility don't recognise it and don't utilise the staff and the talent that's there, but perhaps is latent or perhaps for whatever reason doesn't come to the fore. Um, I, I remember reading one of Jack Welch's books and from General, former CEO of General Electric, I'm sure you've heard and come across his stuff anyway. One of his employees left and he said to him, um, and, and as the employee was handing in his notice, he said, well, you paid for my hands, but you could have had my brains also. And I, and I thought, yeah, he's right. And too often we do that. We just take the person for what they're doing, for the job they're doing, and don't see behind that uh, oftentimes the creativity that lies behind that. And we did a series of forums uh, with, with staff members when we were organising the games 
uh, as a sort of brainstorm sessions and we brought together people from all levels of the organisation that did all sorts of different things and we'd have uh, them come together for sessions. Uh, maybe the brainstorming on the opening ceremony. What do you think? What would you like to see at the opening ceremony? Who should we get? Who should be the stars? Who would the athletes like? Because there were games for the athletes. And so, so all of that. But we found so much fantastic knowledge in somebody that you just never thought, never thought had that within them. But it's amazing how our personalities come forward in different situations. And if we're encouraged as well and in the right environment, you can really see people win through. So I think teamwork and leadership, and, and, and teamwork is leadership is teamwork, or teamwork is leadership, whatever way you want to look at it. But working in teams can, is much more impactful than trying to work um, on your own on an individual basis um, and that was another thing that we had to encourage all the time during the process of the games not to have people work in isolation to have people work as, as, as teams now it was important for us for all sorts of region, re reasons because one we didn't want to lose any intellectual capital we had in the organisation if somebody left because we never had the time to build it back up again because there weren't the days uh, in, the, in the year and the years to do it because we only had four years to organise the games so it was very much a start and a finish we wanted to hold on to every single staff member that came on board and if we lost them we wanted to make sure that um, the capital stayed with other people new. We insisted everybody had a plan. It was one of the things when you came into the organisation that you had a plan. The plan was up in the server and everybody could see it, which also was really important from a communications uh, standpoint as well. But that whole planning sort of helped us as well when we got into crisis situations. And I mean, even now, the hairs stand up in the back of my neck when we talk about the flu that's going around at the moment. The um, What's it called again? Swine. Oh, the swine, swine flu. All I think of was SARS, because SARS broke out five weeks before the games actually started. And that was a disaster for us. It couldn't have been worse. I mean, we're now in fighting with the Irish government and Mayor Martin, who was Department of Health at the time, because they, don't want to, they want to stop the games. They don't want people, they don't want all these 165 countries, particularly coming from China, from Hong Kong, from Canada, all the places where, where, SARS, SARS, where SARS was. Um, then where the countries don't want to come, although all their athletes have been training for years and they want to come. Um, our host town programmes that were going to be hosting those particular uh, countries that had uh, were infected with SARS um, really wanted but didn't want the countries to come. Um, we were trying to work with the American Disease Control, the international disease. We were just everywhere. I mean... If we hadn't been as, 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 as planned in relation to what we were doing as we were, and had, if we hadn't built in the contingencies, um, the games would have been a total disaster, and they would have failed abysmally there and then at that stage, because we, we just had to um, spend so much time working on this and trying to suggest ways and negotiate with people and get over them. Um, which we did, um, and it ended up a win-win situation for everybody through through negotiation and through teamwork that really got us out of that at the end of the day. So those things are all just critically important ultimately um, to uh, to success. Um, let me see what else did I want to say to you. I think I've said most of the of the stuff. Um, I think success and achievement as well, going back to the whole planning and, and vision and all of that, is about the, the work, the preparatory work uh, that, you, that you do. And which, who was the golfer that says, the more I practice, the luckier I get. Um, and it's true. I mean, the more you plan, the, the better prepared you are. The more preparation, uh, the better it is. And we had one quite funny, I suppose, example in a way of where that truly worked. You know, we, we got this, we needed massive big warehouse space, of course, for all the things that we were going to be donated and given and stored going, coming up to the Games. And we got the, 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 the space and everything, of course, we had to get free of charge because the Games cost um, 60 million uh, to put on. So we had to raise that as well as do all the planning and organising as well. Um, so 
obviously anything that we got in kind was cash reducing as well. So anyway, we got the warehouse and then we were looking for all the shelving for the warehouse and we had, jeepers, where are we going to get this? Because there was no point in us buying a whole load of stuff anyway because after 16 days the games were over and we were going to be landed with all this stuff and I certainly didn't want to have it at, at the end of the day. So we didn't know where we'd get the shelves, but we, the, the army were very involved with us, uh, with the games, because obviously they had the expertise in terms of ceremonial and logistics and operational and all that sort of thing. Um, and we had a few volunteer commandants and various people like that in from the army working with us. And we, again, through, you know, the teamwork on where are we going to get shelves and does anybody know anybody that knows anybody that might be able to find them for us? And... Uh, this guy uh, in the army came back to us then and, and he said, yeah, he said, I know exactly where you'll get the shelves. He said, Carl Brew Street, there are, there are shelves in, in Carl Brew Street. So uh, he said, what you have to do is write into the department because everything has to go through the department rather than the army for things like that. So I said, uh, mm, write into the department. Well, I said, look, why don't you... Uh, why don't you do up the letter for me because because you know the, the army so to speak the way we can best put this um which again i'll come back to delegation because that's very very important as well if you want to get things done um so i said why don't you draft up the letter i'll tell you and i'll send it put it for me and i'll send it so anyway he laughed well when i got the letter the letter stated exactly where the shelving was it was like in Carl Brewer Street, in court number 57, like um, area number 40, it had gone <laughs> down to the very last detail, exactly where the shelves uh, were. And now I had to temper it a wee bit because it looked as if, you know, I, I, I must have been on the inside, definitely. <laughs> sent the, but sent the letter into the department. And like that, we had all the shelving we needed. Now... If we had sent in just a regular letter into the department seeking uh, the, the shelving, the department weren't going to be bothered going to find out where it was or how you could get it or anything like that. So what would have ended up? We'd have got a very nice letter back saying, I'm ter- I regret to inform you that we don't have blah, 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 Michelin mass. I know for a fact that's what we'd have got back. But because we, uh, we had our... The guy had his background worked on, we knew exactly where to point them in the direction. So all the department had to do was... We'd done their job for them, in a sense. So all they had to do was pass on the information to the relevant person in Carl Brewer Street, and bang, the shelving was there. We had it installed uh, in uh, in no time. And it's knowing that, you know, the, the, the two-way radios for the games, oh, we needed a phenomenal amount of two-way radios to communicate during the games, and we hadn't a clue where we were going to get them, and they didn't have anywhere near our requirements in, in Ireland. So... I happened to be in Washington at a reception in the lead-up to the Games, and I met this guy again in the, in the Defence Forces, uh, in the US Defence Forces, and uh, he was fairly senior in the, for- in the Defence Forces as well, and I was telling him what we were trying to do in Ireland, with the Games, and were American, and the Kennedys had started them, and blah, blah, blah. That was <laughs> Eunice Kennedy, actually, in the video that you saw, um, that they had started their centre. So he gave me his card, and he said, look, if you ever need anything if that you think I might be able to help you with, just call me, get in touch with me. Definitely. <laughs> if I need you, I'm going to call you. The two-way radio. Somebody said, what about the Americans? They'll have two-way radios. I said, what? The Americans? Do- yeah, they'll have loads of two-way radios. And I said, got out your man's details, contacted him. Not just did we get all the two-way radios that we needed for the games, he actually sent a group of Americans Uh, Defence Force personnel over to train all our volunteers over one weekend and then he sent them over again for the duration of the games just in case we had any problems with the two air radios (laughs) (laughs) so I thought wow (laughs) one you have to ask two you have to know what you're asking for and you have to be prepared and I think when you are all sorts of things can come together and happen for you, I mean we have we have tons of examples of, of things like that, that that happened throughout the games with just having the right information at the right time and using it in a very intelligent um, way as well. So, you know, I'm going to finish because it's time for you to talk and I've probably gone on far longer than I thought I would. Uh, and yeah, a lot of you, most or all of you, in fact, are, are sort of, I suppose, starting out uh, in your careers. And just to say... Um, 
build yourself a network, build a group of people um, around you, um, stay in touch with people, know where you want to go, what you want to do, and you will definitely be successful, regardless of the downturn, regardless of what's happening at the moment in the economy. We can still rise above all that, and we can get things done, and we can achieve.